this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go over all the content that's going to be on the midterm right now. I have one rule for this. No asking me to repeat myself. You're like, shit, I have to pay attention. Yes. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, no, it's a little different. I'm going to go through the specific questions. I'm going to read the questions, be like, make sure you know this, make sure you know that. And then the review online will cover, um, like if you were, like if somebody created a review for the book, I guess. All right, so let's dive in. All right, so here we go. All right, make sure that you know the attitudes of science, definitions, and how to apply them, determinism, empiricism, philosophic doubt, parsimony, scientific manipulation, responsibility. <coughs> make sure you know the definition of a behavior versus the definition of a response. Make sure you know what behavior analysis is and what behavior analysis is compared to other areas of psychology. Make sure you know the difference between phylogenetic and ontogenetic behavior. Make sure you know what fixed action patterns are and how they're different from reaction chains. Make sure you know the difference between a functional definition of behavior and a structural definition. Make sure you understand the basics uh, definition of a stimulus, definition of, an, of the environment. There's going to be a lot of questions um, that require you to understand the difference between uh, stimulus and the environment and its relationship with organisms' behavior. Make sure you know the respondent conditioning process. US to UR, NS plus US to UR, and CS to CR. Make sure you know, make sure you know what higher order conditioning is. Make sure you know the difference between respondent and operant conditioning. Make sure that you can tease out an example of a reflex. Make sure that uh, 
Uh, you know what um, habituation is? Make sure you know what the three-term and four-term contingencies are. Make sure you know all four basic contingencies of behavior. Positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, positive punishment, negative punishment. Make sure you know what the PREMAC principle is and relativity of punishment and how they're similar and different. Make sure you know what extinction is and the behavioral side effects of extinction. So including extinction bursts, operant variability, emotional responding, response differentiation, and spontaneous recovery. Make sure you understand how continuous and intermittent reinforcement relate to the process of extinction. Make sure you know, switching topics, make sure you know the temporal relations for responding conditioning. So delayed, simultaneous, trace, and backwards. So a few questions on that. There's a few questions on the difference between reinforcement and a reinforcer and the difference between a punishment and a punisher. So one is the process and one is a stimulus. Make sure you know all the basic schedules of reinforcement. Continuous, intermittent, fixed, variable, interval, ratio, Time. Also, please make sure you know the effects, uh, the schedule effects for the basic schedules of reinforcement. So, uh, rapid run, scalloping, post reinforcement pause. Question that people get tripped up on often is um, the trends for the schedule effects. So for example, um, variable schedules are steady schedules, uh, but variable ratio is high, moderate to high, and variable interval is moderate to low. Where fixed schedules are on stepwise fashion, kind of like stairs, or a fixed ratio, and then fixed interval are like waves with the scallop, and then the fixed uh, post reinforcement pause. So make sure you know the schedule effects. Negative reinforcements. Make sure you understand the relationship between escape and avoidance and negative reinforcement. (coughs) 
Make sure you know what a progressive ratio schedule is. Uh, there's one question on there on that. Punishment. Make sure you know how to make punishment more effective. So manner of introduction, intensity of punishment, immediacy, schedule, response alternatives, all the different ways to make punishment more effective. Make sure that you know the side effects of punishment. Behavioral persistence, learned helplessness, operant and reflexive aggression. Make sure you know the definition of shaping. Pretty certain the definition of shaping is gonna be on the exam. Make sure you know examples of SDs and S deltas. I can guarantee you there's going to be a traffic light example for discriminative stimuli, controlling stimuli. There's a few vignettes on, what's a vignette? Yeah, it's a little story, it's a little narrative, so it's like a, a word problem from elementary school. So uh, there's a vignette on responding conditioning. There's a vignette on extinction. There's a couple of questions, uh, not just on operant extinction, make sure you know respondent extinction as well. way, so, so the only way that you know whether something is reinforcement or punishment is if the behavior increases or decreases. So there might be a question in there that's designed to trip, uh, trip you up where it says, well, if a child does this and then the child's given candy, is that an example of positive reinforcement? The question is, or the answer is not enough information because you don't know if the behavior increased or decreased or what happened. When you read these questions, make sure that you look at the impact on behavior. It's really important. Oh, that's right. I'm just jumping around the midterm here. That's why it seems frantic. So make sure you know the inadequate and adequate explanations for behavior. So nominal fallacies, reification, circular reasoning. Mentalism. Make sure that you know the difference between proximate and ultimate causes of behavior. <coughs> Make sure you know the difference between positive and negative. Make sure you know the difference between negative punishment and extinction.
There's going to be a few questions just talking about the environment, <coughs> things that we know about the environment. It's constantly changing. Everyone has their own unique environment, and it includes events that occur in your surroundings as well as inside your body, so above and beneath the skin. Make sure you really remember the, uh, make sure you really take time to build your fluency with basic terms like conditioned and unconditioned. You wanna be able to zip through those questions. When you see those uh, terms, you wanna be able to not have to take time to think about them. So become as fluent as you can in those terms. Make sure you know the different domains of behavior analysis. Behaviorism, EAB, ABA. Make sure you know what the dead man's test is, dead person's test. Make sure you know what species continuity is. Make sure you know the difference between covert and overt behavior. Make sure you know what single subject design is. Give me a couple of questions on that. I think I've gone through like every single question on the um, on the midterm. So I'm gonna do just kind of a. I'm just gonna look through this really quickly and give you guys kind of ratios of questions. So there's not gonna be. I'm gonna make a couple of changes to the questions. There's not gonna be more than 70 questions. 
So it's going to be somewhere between like 60 and 70. My momento. <laughs> There's a pretty good balance between vignettes um, and fill in the blank, not actual fill in the blank, but where it has blank and you choose from the, um, from the options below. There's maybe about 10 questions that have two blanks on them. Make sure you know the difference between elicited and emitted and evoked. I missed that one. I can tell you guys about the midterm. Any questions? Yes. What was the one rule for this? <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, that's a good question. So um, we're gonna cover, we're gonna cover um, all of chapter six. So uh, aversive control and behavior, so that's negative reinforcement, escape avoidance, making punishment more effective, side effects of punishment, all of it. Yep. Yeah. Can you explain what cognitive and ultimate Yeah, so did we go over proximate and ultimate causes? So it ties directly into ontogenetic and phylogenetic. So um, proximate causes of behavior are day-to-day -day happenings where, uh, of behavior where ultimate causes are, um, so will be a good example of the difference between the two. Um, so uh, in the book, it goes, it talks about um, immediate and remote causes of behavior. And I believe that's in chapter one or chapter two. Immediate corresponds with proximate causes, remote uh, corresponds with ultimate causes. Ultimate causes slash remote causes are um, phylogenetic in origin. Uh, they're passed down through species history where immediate um, or proximate causes of behavior are uh, through ontogenetic history, so what you've learned during your lifetime. Proximate. Yeah, there's some, there's some concepts in behavior analysis, just like in any uh, area of study where people don't agree on the, on the names and it can be a little confusing. Um, so ultimate causes, you know, like reflexes, things like that. Um, any unconditioned response um, is tied into ultimate causes, um, and then everything else is a proximate cause or immediate cause. Those can get a little confusing because uh, they're tied in together. So um, you can, you know, if somebody flashes a bright light in your face, you know, when you're very young, you're going to blink, but you can also. Um, condition your blinking based on events that occur throughout the course of your life. Um, so you may learn to wink at somebody or stare at somebody or something like that. So it's kind of a delicate balance between the two, but the, the questions are pretty straightforward. Any other content questions? Yes? Is there an example in the Child can stop jogging and start working on school projects when it's 
could re decrease the danger of God. But the book is really of a negative reinforcement because they take away the scolding to increase the focus on homework. How do we know how to, like I read it in a different way, but then yeah, so there's a lot of, and I believe in the book they talk about um, somebody, who, his name is Jack Michael, um, who's made this argument. A lot of other people have made this argument too. We come down on two sides of the camp in, beh in behavior analysis. Should we use positive and negative or not? Because it's difficult to identify whether or not um, a stimulus has been added or increased versus decreased or removed. Um, a lot of people say we should just focus on the behavior, but um, for the sake of the midterm and any questions in this class, it will be very obvious whether or not a stimulus is added or removed. You know, it's always that thing of like, when you change the temperature in the room, are you adding cold air or removing hot air? You know, and then you can get into like a whole physics discussion about it and stuff like that and different issue options. Yeah? And then, so, what Yeah, so emitted, when you're talking about emitted, you're talking about operant behavior. When you're talking about elicited, you're talking about respondent. And then evoked is your, um, it's your cheat word because it covers both. So if you're not sure, um, you'll hear a behavior analyst say this all the time at conferences. We just say evoked. Because if you say one or the other, then half the room is going to jump down your throat. And it's going to be an endless discussion for no reason. So evoked covers both, but if you see on the quiz it say elicited, we're probably talking about respondent uh, behavior. And if we say uh, emitted, we're talking about opera. Good questions. Yes? I don't know, man. Like the um, <laughs> like like the system's always give me a problem with that. And then I, you know, like everybody's gonna panic when the it prints out wrong or it misses. Like I used to do that with the extinction graph, and it would show like a spike, and but you couldn't see like for the spontaneous recovery at the end, and you couldn't see what letter it was, and like people would literally have anxiety attacks. So I, I don't know. I don't know if I want that type of problem in my life on Thursday, so um, it's a good question. I'm going to think about it. I don't know. Yeah, uh, so that's really important. Uh, I'm glad you asked that. So, um, so extinction, uh, we, every good behavior program includes extinction because um, it should involve some form of differential reinforcement. Now, um, you would use, uh, so you would use extinction often, but when you use extinction, you need to be prepared for the side effects, the behavioral side effects of extinction, which include an extinction burst, emotional responses, operant variability, all of that stuff. So if you're gonna use extinction, you need to be prepared for it. With punishment, negative punishment, um, you're removing something uh, to decrease behavior, you have to be prepared for those side effects as well which can be really problematic, um, even more problematic than the side effects of extinction. So um, you always use, remember you always use um, punishment in conjunction with reinforcement. You always use punishment after you've tried reinforcement first. Um, <coughs> yeah. Uh, so remember with extinction, you stop presenting reinforcement. With negative punishment, you're removing reinforcers. Can you, can you that? Yeah, so with extinction, you're, you stop presenting reinforcement. So they continue engaging in the behavior. And you can tell that a behavior is going through extinction by its side effects. So it goes through an extinction burst and operant variability and all that fun stuff. They try different things and then it starts dropping and then you'll see spikes of spontaneous recovery where with negative punishment, you're removing a reinforcer 
and you're going to see aggressive behavior. Uh, if you use it too often, you're gonna see learned helplessness. Um, a good way to identify whether or not, or an interesting way to identify whether or not you're using extinction or negative punishment is, do you use it all the time? So uh, negative punishment is negatively reinforcing for the punisher's behavior. And they become, they come to rely on it too much. So if you use a particular procedure with a child or anybody in your life often, and you know it's not positive reinforcement, it's probably a punishment procedure because dealing with extinction is really difficult. Extinction bursts are a huge pain in the ass. Yeah. So you're asking about the difference between <coughs> positive and negative contingencies? I don't, I don't remember that question. I know that there was a question that said not enough information and that was the answer because you didn't know whether or not the behavior increased or decreased. Yeah. So remember, think about your, um, the four basic contingencies. So positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, positive punishment, negative punishment. Remember that graph, I put it on the PowerPoints. Um, it's not a graph, it's a graph, it's more of a table. And it showed uh, increase, decrease of behavior or the stimulus. So when you see those contingencies, start with, is there a stimulus being added or removed? Then is the behavior increasing or decreasing? Look at both, and that'll give you the answer. Those are actually the easiest questions to answer, but oftentimes, no, they're the simplest questions to answer, but oftentimes people get them wrong because they're speeding through. Um, so make sure and look at it. Do I know, when you read it, you wanna ask yourself, do I know if the behavior is increasing or decreasing? That's really important. Do I know if the stimulus is being added or removed? And the stimulus part, I make no bones about it. Like it's very clear whether or not a stimulus is being added, increased, decreased, or removed. Yeah. Yeah, so controlling stimuli are the uh, parent category underneath, uh, under which you'll find um, Discriminative stimuli, SDs, and S deltas. So SDs set the, uh, controlling stimuli set the occasion for behavior in general. But SDs state that in the presence of that stimulus, if you engage in a particular behavior, your behavior will be reinforced. Somebody have a dry race marker by any chance? I'm totally unprepared today. Maybe? All right, so uh, there is something I want to go over with you with regards to the four-term contingency. I want to talk about that for a quick second. So there are four terms. MOs, SDs, response, and consequence. The first three indicate whether or not a behavior is going to occur right now, and the consequence indicates whether or not the behavior is going to occur again. So the first three components will tell you, will the behavior occur right now? So that's the MO, the SD, and the response effort. Those tell you whether or not the behavior is going to occur at this moment. The consequence tells you whether or not it's going to happen again. signal reinforcement, S delta's signal extinction.
So a response. So these first three tell you whether or not the behavior is going to happen right now. This will tell you whether it's going to continue happening. So in this, the consequence makes all three of these relevant. So this increases, so remember MOs increase or decrease the value of a particular stimulus. Uh, this sets the occasion for uh, the behavior, so it'll tell you, um, so the example, and I'll just tell you uh, one of the questions on the exam, uh, which is the green light. So green light, is a green light an SD or an S delta? It's an SD, for what? Driving. Right, drive through the intersection. So if the light is green and you drive through the intersection, you're gonna be okay? Yeah. Yeah. Not if you live in Miami, but mostly. Right? <laughs> if we haven't covered SPs, I think we're gonna talk about that in chapter eight. Uh, but if you have a if you have a red light and you drive through the intersection, what's gonna happen? Oh Nothing, it's Miami. No, yeah. <laughs> Then the other thing that, uh, to go over, whether or not it happens now, and then this one is whether or not it happens again. So the response, the response effort. So re responding requires energy. Responding requires energy. And if you, and if responding, engaging in a particular response is too effortful, what we refer to as response effort, you're not gonna do it right now. So, MO, S, um, the MO, the control of stimulus, and the response effort all determine whether or not behavior is going to happen right now. The consequence tells you whether or not the behavior is going to happen again. So this reinforces, punishes, <coughs> reinforces or punishes the behavior, or places it on extinction, yes. Can you give an example of that where there are no response? Uh, so anything that you do. So if you, you just ask the question right now. So if I would have told you, believe you, don't ever ask the question again. Are you gonna answer, are you gonna ask the question again? I mean, you might be defiant. Maybe right. you get your behaviors reinforced like that. I would imagine most people would, isn't it? Um, but let's use that. Let's stay with that example. Let's say that I'm not paying attention to the room, and somebody in the back room raises their hand and just holds it up for like five minutes. That sucks, right? That's a lot of response effort. So <coughs> that's going to control whether or not you're going to raise your hand right now. And then if you raise your hand and I say, great question, um, that, that was a really insightful question, and I give you the answer, you're probably gonna do it again. So these three, these first three, tell you whether or not it's gonna happen now. This one tells you whether or not it's gonna happen again. This is the most powerful. It makes all of these relevant. Yeah. Does it have that assistive though? Because if you try to like, raise your hand, like, like, once you get an answer, you're not going to give it again because so that behavior will happen. Like, can you compare it to that or like, you want to talk about like, that? No, 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 no. Uh, we can stay with that. So let's say that somebody raises their hand, and I just don't get to them. So there's the one person that raises their hand, and I say, great question, and I give an answer, um, a satisfying answer. Then there's the next person that raises their hand and I just never get to them. Um, they're engaging in the behavior, but it's not being reinforced. So that behavior is now placed on extinction. Now there's the last person that raises their hand and I say, that's a dumb fucking question. Don't ask, ask that again. So that's probably, for most people, an example of punishment. How do we know whether or not that's punishment? Do we see a decrease? Do they raise their hand again? If they continue to raise their hand again, then they get their rocks off by being first at, right? <laughs> so, you know, this is, this is really, it's, this is a big difference between behavior analysis and other uh, understandings of, of behavior in general, is how we talk about it. Uh, a lot of people don't get that. So just for your knowledge moving forward in behavior analysis is if you understand the four-term contingency, and one more concept, 
Did I go over pinpointing? No. no. Okay, this will not be on your exam. But, <coughs> but this is tied into defining behavior, either functionally or um, topographically or structurally. Pinpointing simply means being precise about behavior, defining behavior as precisely as possible. If you can, if you understand these four terms and you can define behavior precisely, you can answer any question in behavior analysis. That's your foundation right there on that board. Now there's all sorts of other shit that we talk about, schedules of reinforcement and side effects of extinction and punishment and all that. But for analysis purposes, if you understand the four term contingency and you can define your behavior precisely, you can analyze anything. Yeah. Can you give an example of an MO? Of, of an MO? Sure, so what'd you have for breakfast? I'll tell you what I had. Okay, so, <laughs> so, um, so occasionally I do, uh, anybody do intermittent fasting? Yeah. Yeah, so I do that every once in a while. That's a great, that's great for a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, but so I did an intermittent fast this morning. So when I had breakfast, it was at noon. And at noon, so somewhere around 11 o'clock, so I ate last night at 8.30, and then I didn't eat again until like 12, 12.30, right? So I, by the time I got to like 11.30, how was I feeling? I was pretty hungry, right? So I was hungry at this point. Now, how did I know what to do next? What did I see? So I could have seen, there could have been, so behavior, and this is kind of important for just general understanding, behavior starts off being controlled typically by one discriminative stimulus. Then it evolves into being controlled by a variety of different stimuli that become the context of your environment. So I'm hungry. So I look around my kitchen and what do I see? I see um, silverware, I see uh, food, I see a refrigerator, I see cups and plates and bowls and stuff like that. So all of those become the context, and it includes a variety of different FDs and S deltas. So if I have an empty box or something like that, and I know that it's empty, if I go over and grab it, what am I gonna get out of it? Nothing, right? So my behavior is gonna be placed on extinction. So, um, so yeah, so an example of an MO in that, in that particular example would be hunger. And then what am I seeing in the environment that's setting the occasion for my behavior? And then if I eat it and it's satisfying, uh, so the satisfaction is the consequence. Or I could eat it and maybe I have stale food. Or I try something new and it's not as satisfying. So the four term contingency in precisely defining my behavior, what am I doing? I'm walking into the kitchen. I'm uh, opening the refrigerator door. I'm pouring cereal. I'm putting toast, I'm placing toast in uh, the toaster. I'm uh, putting jam on my toast. So. That's being precise about behavior, using directly observable action verbs. Very important. Yes? What's going to go to the screen? <coughs> All right, so let's say, for example, that my house is very clean, but let's say, for example, that my house is not clean, it's a mess. And I'm super disorganized with everything. And I have a box that's sitting on my kitchen, uh, what type of cereal? Lucky Charms, for you all. All right. Okay. Guys, the hat, all right. Um, so I've got a box of Lucky Charms. 
and it's been sitting on my counter for two weeks. It's not even sitting, standing up, it's like hanging over the edge, right? So I pick it up and I look inside, what do I see? Empty, Empty right? So I'm gonna do that probably day one, I'll do it day two, day three, and then day four probably, I'm gonna realize, hey, wait a minute, there's nothing in here. So my behavior is gonna be placed on extinction. So I'm gonna engage in the behavior of going and opening the box, and I'm gonna see that there's nothing in there. My behavior of looking, um, my behavior of opening the box and grabbing uh, cereal and eating cereal is going to be placed on extinction because there's no cereal in there. And then eventually I'll rise up and throw away the box. So extinction, you have to engage in the behavior it's just no longer being reinforced, and it eventually decreases. So extinction is a process. Yes? You know, it, it, you mentioned that SD is for reinforcement and SLK is for extinction. So, I mean, the only way for us to know that is after the, like after the achievement is done, right? Yeah, yeah, so absolutely. So, Boxes that, so then in the future, cereal boxes that are open, you know, with the, uh, you know, like uh, when you're, you get a cereal box, you open it up, and then you pour in your cereal, and then unless you have one of those containers, you just kind of crinkle it, and then you pull the tops together, right? So maybe now the sight of an open box with the flaps up and the the bag open becomes an S delta. It's a signal saying, if I engage in the behavior of looking inside, I'm not gonna see anything. Or if I engage in the behavior of grabbing it. So after a while, I'm just gonna stop grabbing the box. It's just gonna sit there. <coughs> My house is in a mess like that, I swear. So this four-term contingency will take you through the rest of your life. This and pinpointing. Very important. And remember, these three tell you whether or not behavior occurs now. This one, whether the behavior was successful or not. If the behavior was successful, then that tells you whether or not the behavior is going to happen again. So we define success in behavior analysis how? Reinforcement. So were you successful in your endeavor, whatever it is, the behavior was reinforced, it's gonna happen again. Yes? No, I bring that. Right, I'll bring Scantrons for you, and it's gonna take like five minutes for me to hand them all out and all that stuff, or maybe I'll just put it on the table, I'll figure it out. Other questions? The review that you said you were putting on Canvas, uh, have you put it yet, or is it after class? What's that? Remember the midterm review that you said? I'm going to put it on tonight. Okay. What? Any other questions? Sure, so um, I'll give another example of SDs and else deltas. If uh, you want to stay, stay. If you want to leave, uh, just please do so quietly. And um, I'll see everybody. Please be here on time on Thursday. You will have the entire length of the class to finish the exam. No more. Time than that, no less. All right, so SD. Uh,